All right, pack your bags. It's time to go. The voice behind me was deep and gruff, but still had a smoothness about it. It startled me, as I believed I was currently home alone, apart from the elderly old English sheepdog curled up across the room. I knew the voice was coming from directly behind me, maybe only a foot or two away from my ear. I spun around sharply. I was entirely sure what to expect once I did. What I found when I had turned around though, was definitely not what I anticipated. Standing behind me, looking directly at me, was what could only be described as the Grim Reaper. His long black flowing robe hung off his body and drifted around in the air. Two skeletal feet poked out from underneath the robe, which was swaying in a manner that looked more like it was floating in water. The bright whiteness of his bones directly contrasted the deep black of his cloth wrapping. I saw that he was also holding, in one hand, his trademark scythe that he was holding with long, bony fingers that wrapped around the scythe handle, like vines desperately clinging to a pole. What struck me, and definitely frightened me, however, was his face. Well, I say face, but what I really mean is that it was his lack of a face that truly disturbed me. Looking directly at me was a hooded skull. No skin or muscle was attached to the skull. Instead, all there was was bone. I knew straight away that he was staring at me. He didn't have any eyes, just empty eye sockets, but I knew that he was somehow looking at me. It took me a second to process what I was staring at, and Death himself must have realized that I looked scared, because he acknowledged it in his next sentence. Whoa, you look like a deer in the headlights of a truck that's delivering venison, he said, a hint of jovial comforting in his voice. Yeah, you're just not who I expected to see, that's all, I replied. You know who I am then? Death asked me, in a manner that seemed to imply I shouldn't know who he was, even though all evidence pointed to the fact that he was the Reaper. Of course, I responded. You're Death. I can't believe that we actually depicted you correctly, and you look exactly like I thought you would. Well, I wouldn't say that you depicted me correctly at all. I just manifest myself in this weird get-up, so that you might recognize me. Not because this is how I really look. I pondered this thought for a moment and decided that it made sense. It would have been a truly remarkable guess to accurately depict death, as it's usually the case that anyone that sees him doesn't survive long enough to draw him. I think you can guess why I'm here, Death asked me. He almost seems sad to be here, talking to me, but he spoke with a calm professionalism that hinted at the fact that he had been in this situation before. I mean, I can guess why you are, I answered, but why me? And why now? I'm not ready to go. Not many people are, but it would really make my job easier if you just follow me without a fuss. People that make a fuss often find that their ending is a lot messier. Death finished his sentence and then gave me a look that seemed to beg me to just come quietly, as he couldn't be bothered with a messy death today. I don't know exactly how he gave me this look, him being a skeleton and all, but somehow he conveyed this look with just his bone structure. I'll come quietly, I promised Death, but first, I have a question or two. Death sighed, oh, of course you do. What happens if I refused to come with you? I asked, secretly hoping that there would be a way to get out of my sticky situation. I told you, Death replied, sounding slightly annoyed. It will get messy. You might even end up featuring on one of those unsolved mystery crime shows. I'm sure you don't want that. He was right, I didn't want that. I wanted a peaceful death that didn't leave my beautiful wife and two kids wondering what happened to me. 
How will I die if I come with you then? I asked, scared of what his response would be. Gas leak, Death replied, rather nonchalantly. Oh, so peaceful then? Of course, I know you're a decent man. I don't want you to have a terrible end. So what happens when I come with you? I mean, what's after this? I asked Death, hoping he would be able to answer and hoped that the answer would provide me with some comfort. You'll just have to find out for yourself, won't you? I don't want to spoil anything for you. You know how much people hate spoilers. Why do I have to go? Can't I just stay in this world, even as a ghost or something? Well, you see, there's a slight problem in that department. Like your world, the spirit world is facing a similar problem. Overpopulation. The spirit world is full. We went a bit overboard with the whole ghost thing in Victorian times, and now there are no spots left. The old bastards refused to move on as well. So unfortunately, you have no choice but to move into the next plane of existence, Death said, in a manner that seemed like he was fed up with being asked this question. I see. So this is it then. The end of the line for me. I'm just going to cease to exist? I asked Death, knowing full well that this was exactly the case. Yep, now we really must get going. I'll be late for my next appointment. Appointment? So, is death not random? Is it really booked in? I asked. I always thought that death was a random occurrence, and not something that was planned out in advance, but it seemed that death ran on a schedule. It's determined the day you're born. On that day, your name appears in my diary, and that day is set in stone. There's no changing it. That day is the day you die. No ifs or buts about it. So, I was always meant to die today. It appears that way, yes. I know it's a bummer, but you'll get used to it. I couldn't believe that I had been destined to depart the world on this day. I had always been meant to die at this very moment. I wish someone had let me know this fairly important piece of information. Maybe some sort of reminder on my phone or something. Just something that said, oh, hey, you're going to die in a week. But no, it creeps up on you and before you know it, your day has come and you're not ready to go. I wasn't packed or anything. Can I ask one more question? I asked Death, desperately hoping that he would allow me to ask this one final inquiry. I saw him lift up one arm, slightly pull back his sleeve to reveal a small wristwatch that sat around his right wrist. He quickly checked the time on his watch, made a quick mental calculation, then answered. Go on, but you better make it quick, Death said, with a hint of annoyance in his voice. My wife and kids, when do they die? Do they still live on for a while? You're testing my patience, but okay, I will check for you. Death reached one skeletal hand into the inside of his black, tattery robe and pulled out one of the thickest books I'd ever seen. The pages appeared to be endless, and on the front cover, I saw the word diary. Death flicked through the pages, quickly scanning each one before turning to the next one. It took maybe a minute before he settled on a page. He used one bony finger to quickly find what he was looking for. He soon found it, and his finger stood still, pointing at one name. Let's see, your wife. She lives until 93. It says here, passes away surrounded by both kids and her grandchildren. When the word grandchildren exited death's mouth, I felt an internal struggle between sadness and joy. Sadness presented the case but I wouldn't be alive to ever meet my own grandchildren. Joy rebutted this argument by claiming that I should be pleased I have grandchildren and that my wife would get to enjoy them. In the end, Joy won the debate and I felt a smile come over my face. I'm sorry to be the one that has to do this, but it's time to go now. Death broke the silence that followed after he mentioned my grandchildren. I wasn't ready to go, far from it but I knew that it was time. I just had one thing I wanted to do first. 
I motioned towards my dog, who had somehow slept through the entire ordeal. Death gave me a slight nod, which I took to mean that I had permission to say goodbye. I walked over to the large ball of fluff that I call my dog. I bent down and gave her a slight pat on her head. She stirred awake when I placed my hand on her. She looked up into my eyes and at that moment, I knew they would be the last pair of eyes I would ever see. I looked down into her eyes and began to speak to her. You've been a good girl. Now it's time for me to move on. You look after the family now. They're gonna need you. You make sure you're there for them. Just continue to be a good girl and everything will be all right. Goodbye. I know she couldn't understand me, her being a dog and all, but it felt good to say goodbye to someone. I gave her one final pat on the head, a slight scratch under her chin. She's always like that. I stood up and walked back over to death. He was slightly leaning on his scythe. I told him that I was ready to go and asked him one final favor. Can I leave a note for my wife? Can I leave it with you and you deliver it to her when you visit her? Oh, go on then. I'm already running another late, so another minute or two won't hurt, I guess. Mr. Sturth, will you, get, will you enjoy an extra few minutes of life? Death reached into his robe once more, this time producing a small piece of paper and a pen. I took it off of him and began to write. Once I had finished writing, I handed the pen and the note back to Death, who quickly stuffed it back into his robe. He extended one hand towards me and motioned with his head for me to grab a hold of it. I reached out and grabbed onto his hand. It was hard, but also because of the bone, kind of jagged. I squeezed tight onto his hand. He slightly squeezed mine. I felt the strength of his grip and the firmness of his bones. I could tell that he was definitely someone who enjoyed his milk. I looked up at Death, who was staring forwards. It was time to go. I wasn't entirely ready to go, but nevertheless, it was still time. In front of me, I saw a small light. In unison, me and Death took a step towards it, then another. With each step, the light grew bigger and encompassed more of my vision. Soon, all I could see was this bright light, and all I could do now was continue to walk into it. I didn't want to walk into it, but I felt drawn to it, compelled by it, like a moth who's afraid of light. It scared me, but I had no choice but to go towards it. The last thought that entered my head before stepping through into the light was the letter that I was leaving for my wife. I read the entire letter in my mind before taking the final step. It's been a while. I hope you've had a long and fulfilling life filled with laughter and joy and beautiful memories. Grandchildren, eh? How amazing is that? I bet they're cute. And I bet they love their grandma. I wish to see you again. And once you read this note, I guess I will see you soon after. Don't be afraid. Death is a nice guy. He'll help guide you to me. I love you. You trust me. I didn't want to leave you. I've never had a lot in my life. I've never had brand new clothes, always hand-me-downs. I've never had my own room. I've always had to share with some of my siblings. My siblings would sometimes tell me that we wouldn't even have power in the house, but some nights they would need to use candles instead of light bulbs. I've always had to fight for food at dinner time and try and get in before everyone else. I've never gone hungry, but I definitely always could have eaten more. I'm the youngest of 15 children, 12 of whom still live at home with my mother. My mum is a single parent and she tries her best to give us all a happy and content life. And for the most part, she does an amazing job. I've never met or known my father. In fact, I don't even know who he is. You see, all of my siblings have a different dad, apart from Lee and Kayla who are twins. 
Mom says that every time she meets someone, she gets pregnant. And when her partner finds out, they leave. I think the fact that we only know our mother is something that my siblings and I have all come to terms with. Three of my siblings, two brothers and a sister, have all moved out of home and are quite successful. My oldest brother, Simon, has actually found a job in advertising. And even though I don't see him too often anymore, still quite often see adverts he has helped create on the TV. After my siblings moved out, things at home got a bit easier. There's a bit more food on the table and a little bit more money to go around. Most of my siblings are older now as well, so they've all got a job and help out with bills and pay their own way throughout life. Now, it is only me and my sister Lisa who were left at high school. Lisa is in her final year and I still have two more years left of school. As I'm in the final years of my schooling, I'm allowed to choose some subjects that are of interest to me. And one of those subjects that I chose was history. I've always been fascinated by the past and the people and events that happened before I was alive. My recent assignment for my history is to research three different ancient mythical creatures and write a report about the creature and how the myths surrounding them affected different cultures and peoples. I always like to go above and beyond with my reports for history. And so that's why I decided to go to the library in town to research using old texts and books. Well, maybe it was because I wanted to go above and beyond. Or maybe it's because my mom can't afford decent internet at home. But either way, I ended up at the town library after school on Tuesday night, looking through older books to find out about different mythical creatures. This isn't the first assignment that I have visited the library for help. So I've built up a relationship with the librarian, Miss Poole. She's an older lady with short gray hair and she always carries her glasses in her hand, but I never see her actually wearing them. I've established a decent relationship with her over the past year or so, and due to that, she's always willing to help me with whatever I need. In the library, there's a small section of very old books and texts that's usually closed to the public and is only able to be accessed by academics from the university. But Mrs. Poole is always kind enough to let me access it. Once again, I told Mr. Poole about my reports and she told me that she knew just the book that would be helpful. She walked me over to the academic section and told me to put on the special white gloves that you need to use when handling these aged texts. She then also reminded me not to tell anyone about being allowed to view the old books, which of course, I promised not to do. I sat at one of the tables in this section and watched as Mrs. Poole walked away and opened a locked door which I knew all of the books were stored behind. She disappeared into the room behind the locked door and I patiently awaited her return. It was only a minute or two before I saw her returning holding a fairly large hardcover book with yellow brown pages. She placed the book in front of me and told me to be careful with it. Please don't damage it in any way. Otherwise, I will be in all sorts of trouble. There's a 300 year old book, she told me. I'll be back in half an hour to collect it. I hope you find what you need. I looked down at the book and saw that, written in green ink were the words, creatures and beasts. The title was in the center of the cover and underneath the words was a small image of what looked like a red dragon. I admired the artwork for a moment before carefully opening the book. I carefully lifted each page and placed it down gently, not wanting to damage it and getting Miss Poole in trouble. I looked through the many pages of the book, each one with a different painting of a creature, which underneath had a paragraph explaining what the creature was and where it could be found. I looked through the pages trying to find the three that I wanted to write about. I read about the bone fairy from Scotland, the tree walker from Canada, and the sky dweller from India, all of which I found interesting, but I couldn't find enough about them to write about them in my report. 
I kept on turning the pages of the book. When I turned to the page and read the words, the alluring harpy, and saw the small picture underneath, I stopped and couldn't believe what I was seeing. The alluring harpy was a winged woman that had long claws at the end of her arms. She was wearing a light purple dress with her rings sprouting out the back of it. She had a seductive smile and eyes that looked inviting. It looked like the sort of creature you would find in a book about ancient mythical creatures. And normally, I wouldn't think anything of it. But there was something about this picture. The face of the harpy was the face of my mother. I don't mean they looked similar or bear a resemblance. I mean, they look exactly identical. I was looking at a painting of my mother. I sat staring at the photo for maybe a minute or two, but my stare was broken when Mrs. Poole returned and said to me, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to return that book now. The curator is here and I can get into a lot of trouble for allowing you to read this book. She then went to grab the book off the table and return it. I hadn't read about the alluring harpy yet, so I quickly begged Mrs. Poole to give me one more minute to read about it, but she said it wasn't possible. She said that she could take a photo of the page for me though, and I could collect it the next day. I told her that would be great, and I will be back the next day to look at the photograph. She then took the back off of the table and walked it over to the locked door. I quickly left the academic section, careful to avoid being seen by anyone in case it was the curator. I managed to not be seen and I made it out of the front door of the library and onto the street. I looked back at the library and thought about what I had seen. I knew that it was probably just a coincidence that my mother looked exactly like the picture of the harpy. But at the same time, I thought that it was too similar to not have any connection whatsoever. I walked home from the library, plagued by thoughts of my mother and the harpy. I couldn't get it out of my mind. I didn't really want to see my mother when I got home because she would know something was wrong and she would find a way to get me to talk about it. So I was disappointed when I arrived home and saw my mum's beaten up Toyota sitting in the driveway. I slowly walked inside, trying to avoid my mom and go to my room as I share with my four brothers. I walked in through the front door and standing right there in the hallway was my mother. Good afternoon, she said to me. How's your day today? I looked down at my feet and answered that it was a good day. I then tried to excuse myself to go to my room, but she stopped me. She knew something wasn't right. She asked if everything was okay. I told her it was. I don't know why I was so nervous around my mother now. Just because I had seen the picture didn't mean it was her. That's just crazy. My mum would have no idea about Harpy and I knew that I was just being silly, but still, I couldn't help feel nervous around her. Are you sure everything is okay today? You seem different. Like you're nervous about something, my mum said to me again, trying to get an answer out of me. I stood there for a moment before I began to speak. Yeah, everything's okay today, mum, I replied. I just have a history report due soon and I'm not too sure what to write about. Okay, I can give you a hand with it if you want, she offered. I then ex decided to explain about the assignment and tell her about a few of the mythical creatures that I had seen in the book. She then told me she didn't know much about that sort of thing, but would try and help me anyway. I told her about the Bone Fairy and Sky Dweller. I didn't really need help with these, but I was building myself up to mentioning the, the alluring harpy. Eventually, I did manage to mention it. As soon as the words the alluring harpy exited my mouth, I saw the look on my mother's face, the look of fear, the look someone gets when they've been caught out. Never heard of this creature, mum finally managed to say. Sounds interesting though. 
I told her that I didn't know much about it, but I wanted to know more. She then told me that if I didn't know much about it, then maybe I shouldn't write about the creature. She then flashed me a sweet smile and her eyes almost sparkled to me. I suddenly felt a lot more comforted. I realized how stupid I was being and that there was no way that there was any connection between Harpy and the mom. Mom then lightly touched me on the shoulder and I felt a warmth run through my arm and all of my worries of it were now vanished. I now felt a lot better. My mother then excused herself and told me that she had to get dinner ready. She left and went to the kitchen to begin cooking. As I walked off, I could have sworn I saw bulge under the back of her top, right where a wing could have been. But I quickly dismissed this as my eyes playing tricks on me. For the rest of the night, I didn't think too much more about what I had found or the bulge under the top. I slept very well that night, much better than I usually do. The next day, I woke early and got up and got ready for school. When I went down to the kitchen, my mum had already left for work, so I didn't see her that morning. School passed by quickly, and soon it was the end of the day, and I was about to walk home from school, when I suddenly remembered the photo that Mrs. Poole was going to take of the book. I almost completely forgot about it, like it had been wiped from my memory. But I remembered at the last minute and decided to head to the library to get a look into this photo. I made it to the library and was greeted by Mrs. Poole, who when she saw me, reached into her pocket and pulled out a small photograph. She handed it to me and I saw that it was the picture of the page I wanted to read. It's hard to read because the photo was so small. As I managed to read what it read, it read as follows. The alluring hoppy is a dangerous beast. It uses the power of love and desire to get what it wants. And what it wants is to be spread evil across the world. The harpy will disguise itself to look like a human woman, but it actually has sharp claws, sharp fangs, and wings. The harpy will use its powers of seduction to seduce men, where it will then try and reproduce with these men. Its powers of seduction often come from their beautiful smiles, enchanting eyes, and their soft touch. Often, harpies will have multiple children to multiple men. Once the harpy is mated with a man, they will perform a small ritual that involves lighting candles and then eating the male. The harpy will then be pregnant and will soon give birth to the children. Harpies will often have around 15 to 20 children in a 30 year period before waiting 100 years, then starting the mating period once again. Its offspring will appear human, no, but when they reach a certain age, they will begin to develop their own abilities, abilities of seduction and manipulation. They then only have one purpose. They must manipulate as many people as they can. They try and manipulate people to do their best thing, almost like slaves. Once the harpy's offspring are old enough, they will begin to mate as well. And they will try and pass along their bloodline to as many people as possible. The goal of the alluring happy is to slowly take over the human population with their own bloodiness. I finished re reading and I couldn't believe what I had just read. The multiple children with multiple men really struck me. I was also concerned about Harpy's smile and touch as this was something that I had experienced the night before with my own mother. Her touch had seemed to make all of my worries disappear. Maybe they were all coincidences and I'm just worrying about nothing. Or maybe I'm one of the mo offspring and I'm yet to fulfill my purpose. Well, I don't know what to think. So I just stood there in the middle of the day, clutching the photograph of the textbook. Is everything all right, dear? Mrs. Paul said to me, looking concerned because I hadn't moved for a little while. 
I took a second to process what she had just said. I answered that everything was all right, but I needed to get going now. I handed the book back to Mrs. Folk Poole and thanked her for getting it for me. Then I headed out of the library door and began to make my way home. So many questions swirled in my head on the walk home. Questions I wasn't even sure I wanted the answers to. My own thoughts must have distracted me though, because before I even had time to process all of them, I was standing in my driveway, looking up towards my house. The house that my mother was inside of. Everything appeared to be normal, apart from one thing. A small light was illuminating within my mother's bedroom. The light was shining through the sun curtain that blocked the view into her bedroom. I could see that this light was flickering and so I knew exactly what it was, a candle. I felt a small rush begin to go overcome me. Me and my mother never burnt candles since I had been alive. And after what I had just read, I was worried as to why she was now. I slowly walked down my driveway and to the front door, trying to stay as quiet as possible. I knew that it was all ridiculous. My mother couldn't be the same creature that seduces and eats men. It sounded so stupid when I thought of it like that, but there was something, some feeling deep inside that made me believe that it was true. Once I reached the front door, I pulled out my key ring, found the door key and slowly inserted it into the lock. I slowly turned the key and pushed the door open. I couldn't see or hear any of my other siblings. The house was getting eerily quiet, apart from a small crunching sound coming from the room down the hallway, my mum's bedroom. I slowly began to walk down the hallway, taking one small step at a time. As I walked closer and closer to my mother's bedroom, the crunching of that sound grew louder and louder. Once the harbi has mated with a man, it will perform a small ritual that involves lighting candles and then eating the male. This line that I read in the old book kept on repeating itself in my mind. What if that's what's happening now? I was now standing close to the bedroom door, sweats was running down my face and my heart was racing. I could still hear it, the crunching sound from beyond the door. It sounded like something was scraping and crunching down on bone. I really didn't want to think about what that really sounded like. I placed my hand on the door handle. Was I really about to enter this room? I tried to slow down my breathing and relax and try to think of a rational explanation for all of this, but I couldn't think of one. I began to turn the door handle. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was fear. Maybe it was the loud snapping sound that I heard as soon as I began to turn the handle, but something made me stop and let go of the handle. I left the door closed and began to walk away. I think I just didn't want to know what was happening on the other side of the door. I went to my room and put in some headphones to try and block out any noise that may be coming from my mum's bedroom. I didn't really sleep that night. Only a few minutes here and there. The thoughts of my mother and the creep and the harpy occupied my mind. Eventually though, it was morning and I must have dozed off because I was awoken by my mum entering the room. Good morning, darling, she said to me, her voice bright and cheerful. I have some excellent news for you. You're gonna be a big brother. I'm pregnant. I'm sure you have all heard the Wilhelm scream. You may not have heard of it, but you almost definitely would have heard the scream itself. It often rears its head in some of our most popular movies. It makes an appearance in the Star Wars films. It's even in Lord of the Rings. The now famous scream is deeply ingrained in our movies and our culture. 
that a lot of people know the sound, but they probably don't know how or when it originated. Its first use was in the 1951 movie titled Distant Drums. But what if it didn't actually originate from that film? What if the scream actually had a lot darker origin? Quite a number of years ago now, I was a young actor and I actually managed to appear in a few feature films. I was only around the age of nine when my acting career was in its prime. I had been supporting actor in three quite well-known movies and was on track to becoming a household name. It was on the set of my fourth film that everything changed. I lost my career because of what I discovered. And worse, I lost my innocence. I won't say the name of the film that I was working on when I discovered this secret, but I will say that it was one of those generic family comedies that was filled with a couple of big name actors. I was cast in the role of the youngest son in the quirky family, and this was the movie that was supposed to launch me into stardom. I was already recognizable, and most people would probably know who I was if they saw me, but no one really knew my name, and this was the movie that was supposed to change that. I'd only been on set for three days and had only shot one complete scene when it happened, the day that I found the tape. I can't remember exactly what Stan's job was on set, but I had seen him running around set each day that I was there. He always had his hands full and would be doing a quick little half jog to deliver what he was holding to the right person. I don't think I ever saw him without a script or a prop in his hands. And I didn't ever see him when he wasn't out of breath from the endurance one he would have to do around set. The other thing I remember about Stan was that he was notoriously forgetful. You would often see him run across the set, stop midway to his destination, turn around, and then when he would reappear, he'd be holding something extra that he'd forgotten about. I later found out that Stan had actually been fired from a previous film for forgetting to take a movie script with him and he left it sitting on a table in a busy coffee shop. That's the sort of man he was, forgetful but also hardworking. I liked Stan and one thing I do recall is his warm smile and his kind words that he would say to me whenever he would see me on set. On the third day I was on set, just after filming was wrapped, I saw Stan jog through the set, down a small corridor that was in the studio, and enter a small room that joined onto the corridor. My parents were always on set with me, but I saw that they were busy with a producer, so I decided to follow Stan to this small room. I don't really know why I followed him. I don't know him that well, but something about him made me feel comfortable. And so I decided that I would go and say goodbye to him before I left the studio that day. I walked down the small corridor and entered the room that I had seen Stan enter. He was no longer inside. My immediate thought was that he had forgotten something and so had left to retrieve it and that he would be back here soon. I decided to wait in the room and await his inevitable return. I looked around the room and saw a large number of television screens. The scenes were stacked four high and were also four across, 16 screens in total. There also appeared to be some sort of control desk located just underneath the large collection of monitors. Me, being only nine years old at the time, became interested in the amount of expensive equipment in front of me and so walked over to the desk and sat down in the single chair that was living in front of the desk. On the desk was a number of video players and what appeared to be some sort of editing equipment. In front of one of the video players, there was just one black tape. I guess I just assumed that maybe it was a tape from that day's shooting or maybe a tape from a previous day. 
I remember picking it up, looking at the front of it and seeing a small piece of masking tape stuck to the front. Written on the tape in thin black marker was the word Wilhelm. I didn't know what this meant and it didn't seem to relate to the movie that we were filming. Curious, I decided to insert the tape into the video player. Once I did, static appeared on the screen for a moment before a video began to play. The video that started to play was shot in black and white and the footage was quite grainy. It looked like it had been filmed a number of years ago. The video depicted a shirtless man that was tied to a chair, his face filled with terror and pain. It started by focusing on this bound man, but then a voice came from off camera. Okay, Wilhelm, we're gonna try this one more time, the faceless voice said. It was a higher pitched, nasally voice that seemed to be excited about something as he was speaking quite enthusiastically. And action, the voice said, still from off camera. Just as he said the word action, there was a loud crack and the man tied to the chair let out a howl of pain. I don't think my nine-year-old self knew exactly what had happened. But now when I think back to the tape, I realized that the man bound in the chair had been whipped. The man's scream will forever be ingrained into my mind. It was a scream of intense pain and suffering. It didn't last long, but the intensity of the scream is something that I wish I never heard. Obviously though, the scream wasn't intense enough for the faceless voice. As once the man finished screaming, he said, no, 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 that is simply not good enough, Wilhelm. I know it, you know it, and the audience is going to know it. It wasn't a scream of someone in real pain, in real terror, a scream that will live on in infamy, and you're going to give it to me. Again, another crack could be heard and once again, the man in the chair, who it seemed was called Wilhelm, let out another scream of pain, this time louder than the previous one. It was still not good enough though, as the man off camera soon explained. That was better Wilhelm, it really was, but still, it's just not quite good enough. You need to dig deep and give me a proper scream. Imagine, you are in pain, you are suffering, which in your case should be quite easy to do. You need to turn your animalistic instincts and give them a ferocious primal scream. I know you can do it. You just need to dig deep. Again, the voice said again, this time sounding slightly agitated, but still excited. This time after the word again was spoken, there wasn't another loud crack sound. Instead, I saw something swiftly cross the screen and then suddenly a large slash appeared across Wilhelm's chest. Blood began to form along the large gash and then started to run down his chest and towards his lap. Wilhelm let out his loudest scream yet, a scream of pure pain, which could curdle the blood of anyone that heard it. I know that it certainly sent shivers down my spine when he finished his scream, Wilhelm began to sob, but still didn't say anything. Again, the only one speaking was the enthusiastic voice from behind the camera. You're almost there, Wilhelm, almost. You are so close, but there's something not quite right. The scream is the conclusion to my masterpiece, so it needs to be haunting, confronting and memorable. I can guarantee that if you manage to produce the scream that I want, then you will be known, you will be famous. That's what you want, isn't it Wilhelm? I heard the voice say. Wilhelm didn't answer the question that had just been asked of him, but instead he continued to sob, possibly out of fear, but mainly in pain. He sat in the chair, ropes tied around his wrists and ankles, his head facing down towards his lap where his blood was beginning to pool. The voice spoke again, this time only saying one word, action. As soon as the word left his mouth, I saw something blur across the screen. 
the blur turned out to be an arrow that flew across the screen and found itself wedged into Wilhelm's chest, right near his heart. Wilhelm let out one final scream before his lifeless body slumped forward in the chair. He let out the familiar scream of the now famous Wilhelm scream. Once Wilhelm had finished his dying scream, the faceless voice had just one more word to say. Perfect. After the final word had been spoken, Static once again returned to the screen. The tape had finished and younger me was left staring at the screen, unsure of how to process exactly what I had just seen. You weren't supposed to see that, kid, a voice from behind me said. I quickly spun myself around, unsure of who was behind me, unsure of what they would do to me because of what I had just uncovered. I turned around and saw the familiar, sweaty face of Stan, who was looking down at me, a look of worry spread across his face. I am really, really sorry that you had to see that. I know I shouldn't have just left the tape lying around, Stan said apologetically. He seemed sincere, and it seemed that he wasn't going to cause me any harm for what I had just witnessed. I didn't know what to say back to him, and so I opted to remain silent. Stan spoke again. I guess another person now knows the true origin of the scream. Not many know it, and they're trying their best to keep it that way. I didn't exactly know who they was, but it seemed that a number of people were aware of the true origin of the scream, and that they definitely didn't want that secret getting out. Somehow though, a nine-year-old had stumbled across the dark secret. I stayed silent for a moment before I managed to ask one question. If that was real, then why would they keep using that sound in movies? I managed to ask Stan. Well, that's the funny thing about the Wilhelm scream. No one actually includes it into their movies. It just appears. No one knows that their movie is going to include that horrible sound until the premiere of the film. It's just there in the middle of the film. Some think it is someone in editing inserting it into the film, but not me. I have my own theory. I think it's Wilhelm's final call for help, his final plea to be heard. He devoted his life to a film and so he wants to be recognized for it. He's making himself heard and is making himself a star. Of course, that's just my theory. I don't think anyone really knows exactly why it appears in so many movies, but that's just what I like to think. After that, I was promptly fired from the movie. I guess word must have gotten out that I now knew the truth behind the scream. And I guess they thought I knew too much. I never recovered from that firing, and my career as an actor is now a thing of the past. I've lived with the truth for many years, but I believe that it is now time to share what I know. I want others to know. I want Wilhelm to receive the acknowledgement he deserves. He did, after all, give his life for that sound. <laughs>